Okay. So hello, everyone. Welcome to um, the UNCG Library series of webinars on online learning and innovation. I'm the online learning librarian, as well as the kinesiology and public health education librarian, Sam Harlow. Uh, so in this series, different UNCG instructional technologists, uh, ITS staff, and faculty cover topics on online learning pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools, such as Canvas, Google, Box, et cetera, and more. These 30-minute webinars are recorded in WebEx meetings, where we are right now, and placed on this library webpage that I'm about to drop into the chat. So this page will also contain other applicable links and presentation materials um, as well. So um, we also give the recording file to the ITC or ITS or faculty member presenting the materials, and they can put it where they see fit. Um, and these are hosted on YouTube after the fact and eventually closed captions. So I'm going to cover some logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red. It's a little mic icon. Um, also at the bottom of your screen, you can click on that same icon. But you can turn your audio back on by clicking that same audio icon again to make it not red at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenter. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in chat. You still have to connect to the audio at the bottom of the screen. If you have questions throughout the web webinar, please put them into the chat, and I will track the questions while the presenter um, goes through the materials. So if you have any technical issues during this webinar, I'm going to throw my email address uh, into there, and as well as my phone number, because I'll be muted and it won't interrupt the flow. Um, but do we have any questions as I'm putting these final things into chat before we begin? Okay. So uh, without further ado, this session is hosted by Susie Bowles, a UNCG Online Instructional Technology Consultant, and it is on Google Slides and Canvas. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Susie. Thank you, Sam. Well, welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be sharing with you a little bit about Google Slides and Canvas today. It's one of my favorite tools, um, and I just wanted to briefly introduce myself to those of you that I haven't met. Um, I'm over here in the Becker Weaver building on the edge of campus uh, as part of the UNCG online team and I'm the assistant director for instructional design and I absolutely love it. Um, so hello to those of you that I've met before and welcome to those of you who are uh, new. So I'm really excited about uh, getting started and I'll just go ahead and hit the ground running here. What I'm going to do is share my slides on the screen and that way everybody can see them in full detail. So let's see, I'll get that set up here. Okay. Is everybody able to see these slides? And I'll rely on Sam to um, respond to your, your questions and ideas in chat as we go along because I'm not actually able to see them myself. And we can see your slides great. Excellent, all right. So this presentation um, was first presented, uh, I guess, a couple months ago um, by my um, colleague, Nathan Myers, as well as myself, and we've updated it slightly since then, but um, we're just really excited to share with you very practical how-to steps about Google Slides and its purpose and how it kind of integrates with Canvas in various ways. So I have some goals for this session that I dreamed up. Um, why would we ever choose to embed Google Slides presentations? And then the how. How do we actually go about uh, creating them, publishing them, and embedding them into Canvas? And then what are some final design and accessibility features to consider um, to make sure that all students can learn from Google Slides and that we haven't excluded anyone on the basis of how they learn? But I also want to hear from you. Um, what else would you like to learn about Google Slides and Canvas? I'm sure that you probably had some thoughts about what this might entail when you signed up for the webinar. So I would encourage you now to open the chat window that Sam was speaking of and to just add something in there if there is anything not on this list that you would like to learn. And Sam, I again will rely on you. If there's anything popping up in that chat box, please just let me know. So far, nothing. So um, I will let you know. All of those learning objectives look great for me. Okay. Well, if anything comes to anyone's mind as we go along, just put that in the chat box and Sam will relay to me. 
So first of all, why? What is the big picture here? Why would we embed Google Slides? We already have presentation tools like PowerPoint. Um, I've, worked, I've had the pleasure of working with um, many, many instructors here at UNCG, and PowerPoint is a common tool. So why would we choose a different one, such as Google Slides? Um, after doing some research, Nathan and I compiled this list relying on uh, a, a few articles and things that others have seen, as well as our own experience, to kind of compare what Google Slides can give you that PowerPoint cannot. First of all, if you create a Google Slides presentation and embed it, then wherever you embed it, if you make an update, the updates are going to show in those locations. So for example, if you create a um, instructor introduction, and maybe you're teaching four classes this semester, well, you can use that same Google Slides instructor introduction presentation and embed that in four different courses. And then one day you may go, ooh, I really need to update that. Something's happened. Maybe I got a dog. Maybe I got a new degree. I, I want to tell the students something more. So if you make the updates in the original Google Slides presentation, wherever you've embedded it, it's going to dynamically update. So it can save you a lot of time. Whereas with PowerPoint, there are many, you're going to have to create a new version of the file every time. And, and that can cause a lot of extra work on your part and even some confusion when you have different versions of the same PowerPoint. Additionally, going on to the second bullet, when you have a Google Slides presentation embedded in a, a Canvas site, then you don't have to have the student download it. They are viewing it within the site through their browser. So if they're on a slow connection, you know, many of our students may be rural or located in a place that just doesn't have a strong, robust internet connection, then downloading a PowerPoint file can really take a lot of time. This avoids that issue. Also, we have students using Macs, students using Windows devices, all different types, and PowerPoint can sometimes behave differently on different devices. So this, by using Google Slides, which is embedded in the browser, you circumvent that issue entirely. And finally, um, for the students, they're able to view this in their same window. And I'm going to demonstrate some of these things to you in a moment. But instead of having to open a new application window, like you would with PowerPoint, you can view it in the same screen. I'd like to share with you a, a few examples so you see what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to minimize the um, presentation here and open up my Canvas demo course so that we can all see it. So this is just a, we call it just DCL test. It's just an old um, sandbox area in Canvas that allows us to kind of play around with some of the features of Canvas and demonstrate things like this. And so this tutorial example is something that I helped to develop for um, a kinesiology course called Kin 717. And we were giving students instructions on how to use YouTube Live to record themselves and then share that presentation with their class. Because a lot of instructors have wanted to do group projects in an online class, and they had a hard time going, well, how are students going to present if they can't even meet in person with their group? How are they going to present back to the class in video form so that I can evaluate their speaking and, and presentation style? These instructions were our answer to that. So you can see that the Google slide is directly here on the page. And at the bottom, it has the play bar that allows you to advance forward and backwards in the slides. And you can also see all the different slide numbers here. And so a student would click through and be able to see step by step what are their instructions for using YouTube Live. So you see, I haven't had to download a PowerPoint. I didn't have to wait for that or worry that I had the right program. It's just right here on the Canvas page. And it just looks really nice. You know, um, if, if I had used Canvas instead of embedding Google Slides, all this information, I would have had to use tabs or accordions or just put it in long linear format on the page, which could have meant a really long page. So this is just another alternative for how you can present information. And you can see that you know, we've spent some time to make the Google Slides look nice and have headers and have images, et cetera. So that's one example. And like I mentioned earlier, this is something you can use for multiple classes. You create one Google Slides presentation, and then you can embed it with the embed code, as I'll show you later in this presentation, into multiple 
web pages or in, you know, other places that you would want to share it with your students. You can share it by link or by embedding it. So let's look at a second example of a lecture. So you may go, okay, well, you know, I can see how this would be useful for step-by-step um, -step technology instructions, but how would this be useful for a lecture when I'm trying to um, follow my learning objectives and deliver students, you know, a pretty complicated message here. So let's look at that example. Let's go here to my modules and go to the lecture examples. <clears throat> And so this one was uh, developed for an undergraduate course on systems thinking. And the goal was to take a pretty complicated topic, um, the, the concept of how to map the complex systems around us in a visual way. So how do you take, for example, all of the systems involved in our um, political system here in the US and map those? Uh, and there's a specific set of tools you can use in systems thinking to help you communicate those complex visuals. And so this uh, takes the place of what would have been an oral delivery lecture and transfers it into these Google Slides presentations. So students can read and they can see an image that supports what they're reading. And it, you can see how it kind of builds on itself. The diagram changes as the student is learning. Again, they can have the benefit of going through this at their own pace. Some students find that their instructor lectures very quickly and they can't quite keep up. Um, or maybe they have a little trouble understanding their instructor, just communication language-wise. By having this Google Slides lecture to either supplement what the instructor is telling them or to be a substitute for it, it can really help the student to learn at their own pace and to really ensure they understand all the concepts. And so I think you get the picture. And you can see there's not a lot of text on these slides, but it's enough to be conversant. Um, these slides are written in a way to be in second person to the student. They speak to the student as you, and they really try to be as if the instructor was speaking to the student. As a second example, which is also on that same page, you can see that, um, let's see, you can see that there can be more images and that you can also hyperlink to things from the slide. So if I were to click this, it's going to pop open a new tab and show me the image source. So this is a great way to share links with the students as well to encourage them for further exploration on a topic. Um, again, unlike a PowerPoint where you're having to download the file and then once they click a link that's in the PowerPoint file, it's going to open up in their browser, this would just conveniently open in another tab uh, and just be a little more seamless. Okay. Looking at another example, this one's my favorite. This is an interactive Google Slides example that was developed for an economics course. So let me pull that up. OK. So the challenge was this economics professor wished for students to see how a graph would change if you were to increase or decrease supply or demand. And so we were tasked with you know, how to create an interactive object for that. So this is not a lecture. This is not a tutorial. This is what we call like a learning object. It's something that is ungraded and meant to help the student practice or comprehend um, a key concept within the course. And so what we were able to do is if the student clicks on, say, increase demand, you see how the graph changes. Now maybe I want to decrease supply. Oh, look, the graph changes like this. And I wish I were an economist to tell you <laughs> the precision of exactly what this means. But um, this is what the instructor hoped for, is that students can choose to increase or decrease supply, or increase or decrease demand, and see the resultant effects on the graph. So how did we accomplish that with Google Slides? And how could you develop similar interactive examples for your own courses? Well, there's a little bit of a trick to it. So in Google Slides, you can actually, uh, and PowerPoint does this too, but you can actually set um, links within the slides to jump to other links. 
And so in this interactive example, uh, there's actually a different slide for each iteration of the graph. And if you were to click increase supply, it's jumping to the slide that shows increased supply. And if you were to click decrease supply, it's jumping to that slide. Um, and so for when you're looking here at the slides I'm using right now for this presentation, so I could set slide one to jump to three or to jump to five. Um, and so the what we had to do though um, is in Google Slides, if you click anywhere on the slide, it advances. Um, and, and so that's problematic. That's in presentation mode. Um, here in the embedded view of the slides in Canvas, um, let's see, it doesn't proceed, you know, with you, if I'm just clicking out here. It only proceeds if I'm clicking on these buttons. So the way we accomplished that was actually by putting um, a big transparent button over the whole slide, and that is always set to jump to the current slide. So that way, if they click it anywhere else, it's not automatically advancing. Um, and we set these rectangular buttons to, again, have that kind of a hyperlink to jump to various slides. And in this way, this is sort of a branching learning object, and it's, um, it's responding to what the student is clicking and allowing them to see the results of their choices. So you could do this same kind of thing in a case study. If you had, um, maybe a student is having a conversation. Perhaps they're a nursing student and they're looking to diagnose a patient and uh, consider options for interventions and, and prescribe something. So you could have um, information about the patient and a photo of them and then have two or three questions for the nursing student to ask. And when they click on that button, it could go to a slide that then shows the patient's response to that question. So I think you can see there's a lot of possibilities for using this branching structure within Google Slides, and it's all conveniently embedded here in their Canvas course, so they're not having to learn a new tool or, or um, download anything. It's just right here so they can practice and play around with it. Are there any questions about those examples before I move on to um, the next portion of the presentation, which is kind of showing you the how, um, how to set up your Google Slides presentation so you can embed it. So there is a question from Paige. Where do you as the instructor see the branching slides? Great. Uh, let's see. So you as the instructor see them in this view that I'm showing you right here. Um, you, you see them on the left. Uh, it's, it's, it shows you like a linear structure. Uh, it might be really helpful if I were to actually pull up the, the um, Google Slides example for this exercise so that you could see it. And Paige, if you wanted to add any more to that question, I can, I can be more specific. Let's see. You know what, I might not be able to find it right now. And so what I can do is uh, also share that with Sam to share after the presentation. But the instructor would see it in this back-end view of Google Slides, the edit view, where you can edit directly on the page. Um, and then on each of the, the buttons, you can set the hyperlink to jump to a certain page. Yeah, I think she's talking about the adding in the hyperlink. So if you, you know so. where that is. Yeah, uh, let's see. So here's an example um, for, for Paige and for anyone else wondering. So let's say I wanted to make this text right here, uh, which right now says examples interactive exercise. Let's just say it would say jump to slide nine, which of course you'd want to word that in a more interesting way in your actual case study. Um, but here's how you would do it. You would select the object. So for right now, select the text box. And then you click insert and link. And it'll say you can paste the link or you can search for slides in this presentation. I hope everybody can see that. I know it's kind of small text, but you click slides in this presentation and then you're able to select from the entire gallery of all the slides in there. So I could say if I wanted to jump to slide nine, I would simply search for slide nine, click that and you click apply. 
now in present view, I should be able to click slide nine and there I go, I've jumped to it. And so it takes a little bit of setup in order to um, you know, get your links all the way you want it. And I always advocate for testing it out and making sure it works correctly before you publish. Um, so you know, that's maybe having a colleague look at it or, or um, even a, a former student if you wish. Um, but I do think that this is a really handy and quick way of kind of creating interactivity within your slide. So it breaks us out of that mentality that the slide presentation always has to be linear. Are there any other questions about maybe that interactive exercise or the other embedded Google Slides? Not right now. All right. Well, keep them coming. Great question, Paige. So let's move on to kind of the how. How do we set up our Google Slides presentation so that you can create it, publish it, and embed it in your Canvas course? Um, it's very simple, actually. As you can see from these slides, once you've set up your slides, you're going to go over here to File and Publish to the Web. Okay? And then once you do that, there are two options. There's linking and there's also embedding. And if you were to click Embed, it gives you some size options. I typically choose Medium for a Canvas uh, page. It seems to look you know, about the right size. And then you have your gobbledygook here. <laughs> it, um, it may look scary. It's code. But trust me, all you have to do is copy this and then go over to the Canvas page where you wish for it to be embedded. So I'll go over to my Canvas test page here. Um, and I had previously embedded this slide here, so I'll delete that real quick. So again, I have copied this code. I go here to my Canvas page, and I have gone into the HTML editor. That's critical. Canvas has your um, what we call your WYSIWYG view, your what you see is what you get view. It, this is what the page should look like right here, if I were saying you know, title of the page, et cetera. And it has this HTML editor view, which is the back end of the code view. So I'll paste the code in that view and click Save. And now my Google Slides presentation is here, and it brought with it the handy dandy play bar. So you can see the very presentation I'm using right now can be embedded right here on a page. So it's very handy. Let's see. So that covers how to publish it and how to paste it basically onto a Canvas page. Those are those two slides. I just kind of went through them verbally. But um, you will get a copy of these slides afterwards if you want to revisit each of those steps. And I would like to talk about something else that's really important and near and dear to my heart, too, and that is accessibility. Um, here at UNCG, you know, we always strive to be accessible in everything so that every student, um, faculty, and staff can have the full benefit of what we're creating. So if you're a student, so that you can learn from anything that um, an instructor has developed with an instructional purpose. And so we want to make sure Google Slides, too, are accessible. And that has some practical considerations. First, each slide must have its own unique title. And that's important because, as you saw um, here, when I'm searching through for which slide to go to, a student who is using a, a, a screen reader or another assistive device to kind of navigate in between slides, they're using the titles that you set up for your slides in order to, to know where to go. So for example, um, maybe I'm using a screen reader and I've, I've gone through you know, half the lecture and I go, you know, what was that in the beginning? I wanted to revisit that point. Well, it's hard to find my place if the slides aren't labeled clearly. Um, and a trap we often find is that instructors tend to label the top of each slide with like a, a word that doesn't mean much, like lecture or slide one. So we need descriptive titles that are each unique per slide. Additionally, audio must be captioned. So the examples I showed to you today don't have any audio with them. You can just click through, and there's no music. There's no voiceover narration. But you can do that with Google Slides if you like. I know we have a lot of instructors who like to express their lecture in their own words and you know, perhaps use the presentation slides as a supplement. So how do you do that? Uh, Mika Davis, who's another one of our ITCs here at UNCG, recently posted a tech tip. So um, I'll point you to that link. Um, maybe Sam can share that at the, in the chat box. 
but it, it shows you step by step how you can use a recording software such as Screencast-O-Matic or Jing or Camtasia and, and um, walk through your Canvas slides and record yourself presenting them. So I'll just do a quick demo here because it, Google Slides is so clever, they've actually added a feature where it can caption your words almost instantly and with a high level of accuracy. And that's really important too, to ensure that students who either have issues with hearing or perhaps struggle to understand their instructor for any number of reasons, students who may be um, on a, a noisy bus, you know, driving somewhere and they're trying to watch their, their video for their course, they can actually read the captions. There's a myriad of reasons that captions are extremely useful to students you know, of all backgrounds. And so let's look here at it as an example of the real-time captioning. So I'm going to present this screen, and if I go down and click Captions here, you can see that the slide intelligence software is actively and almost instantly converting my voiceover narration into text. So this is exceptionally helpful if you are live presenting a Google Slides presentation or if you are recording this presentation uh, to be shared asynchronously with students in the future. Hey, <laughs> I really like this feature a lot. And I promise you I'm not typing. It's really doing all of that <laughs> uh, on its own as I speak. So I'll exit out of that. I'm glad we had a few minutes to, to demo that. I'm going to speed it up a little bit because um, at the end. Yeah, there's a, there is, I have a question and Paige has a question. So hers first. If the audio captioning is incorrect, can you correct it in the program is her question. I don't believe so. I believe that it is um, recording it on the screen. And when you record a screencast-o-matic or Jing or the other tools I mentioned, it's recording the view of that. So it's not... It's not what we traditionally think of as like attaching a captioning file, like an XML or SRT or VTT file. And my question is like in Google Slides, when you're making a tutorial or something like that, where you're not using the header, um, you know, through Google Slides, how do you add in a header for accessibility, um, even if you're not using a header, like just using an image or something like that? Right, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for you on that, Sam. Um, I think traditionally we've just done text headers at the top, uh, and I know that the slide titles themselves are useful in um, when you're using a screen reader. I think students are able to navigate between, like even if I didn't include this title here, for example, considerations accessibility, they would be able to know that there was a slide 10 there. It just would be called slide 10. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but our general recommendation is to try to provide a title on each slide so that students cited and, and those using a screen reader can navigate it. All right. Just to wrap up the presentation here too, um, I always like to mention as part of accessibility that um, you add alt text to all of your images. And the way to do that is really simple. You paste an image. This is just a funny one that we found because we thought it would maybe inspire you with some creative captions. But you would just um, right click your image and click Alt Text. And then it pro provides something here. So our, our humorous title was that this was one potato victim and two spectators. <laughs> and um, this, of course, is useful if a student is using a screen reader. They come across an image. If you haven't added alt text to it, sometimes it'll just rely on the title of the image, which could be 001.jpg and not mean a thing. Um, or if it's decorative, it's, o it's okay not to have alt text. You know, if it's, if it's just a um, design detail that is not instructional, then it's okay not to have alt text. But if it's an important uh, design, you know, which we hope you would always only put important designs into your instruction, um, then you'd want to add alt text. Uh, I think there's one other two notes on the accessibility that I, I must. Um, I really like the tool Grapple Slides for a quick accessibility check. And um, so that link is also available if we want to send that out through chat. It's a free tool and it'll scan all your Google Slides and let you know if there are any issues with 
maybe reading order or slide title. So Sam, maybe we could try one of the slides that you mentioned that wouldn't have text on the slide and just see how it would respond to that and just see um, what it would recommend for various titling of slides that um, do not have text on them. And finally, I think these additional resources have been really helpful to me and I hope that you would maybe want to go and explore them. But these are resources for how to make slides. So Paige, when you're asking about hyperlinks, maybe um, you, know, you could check some of these out because it'll give you the how-to. Publishing and embedding, I went through that with you. That's kind of my version of the steps, but there are other steps with screenshots. There's a video that walks you through basically what we just talked about in this webinar. And then finally, accessibility. You can use Grackle Slides as a nice automatic checker. And then um, I wanted to also let you know that if you have a pre-recorded video that you wish to request captioning for, UNCG has a specific form where you can request up to 15 hours of captioning for your videos. That's um, live captioning or pre-recorded captioning. I so encourage you to check those out. I have really enjoyed this session. I hope I've taught you something new. I've already learned a little bit going through here too. And uh, I would encourage any questions at this time if we have any time. Thank you. So I've dropped all those links in the chat. I'll also drop a link to this slide, but this slideshow um, will be available on the webinar page as well. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat or just let me know and I'll unmute you. The chat is on the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat icon and then it will show up on the bottom right of your screen. Um, I did mute some people as they came in just to kind of help with the feedback, but I'm happy to unmute you now if you'd rather have a conversation. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? So Paige said, do you have time to return to the econ example, slide number seven? Um, and it's okay. I mean, if people need to leave because it is past 1.30, that's fine, but um, I am happy to stay and we can keep yep. talking. Absolutely. I can go back to that Paige, what do you want to know? Let's see. I'll share my screen again. Paige, are you looking at um, hyperlinking to other slides to create interaction? Paige? I'm back to sharing my screen. She now. said maybe. Um, so Paige, you want to be, you know, are you talking about hyperlinking to another slide or are you talking about something else? Do you want me to unmute you? Yes, unmute. You're <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> that, that popped up. Hi, Paige. Paige, are you speaking right now? I'm not able to hear you. Hey, Paige, your audio is not working through that headset. So the headset doesn't work, I don't think, in terms of that. So you can either take that off and try to use your computer mic, or you can use the chat, or email us later. Yeah, Paige, I would be really glad to sit down with you and walk through this interactive exercise together. And that goes for anyone who's here. Um, it's, it's definitely one of the more fun things we've done with Google Slides. And uh, my colleague, Matt Lloyd, developed it. And so um, I know he and I would be more than glad to kind of talk about the problem solving we went through to, to get it functioning properly and um, how we were able to use this model for as a uh, as a model for many other assignments that involve branching, decision making, um, tasks like that. Typically ungraded, typically learning objects that allow you to, to navigate back and forth, not in a linear fashion. So we can take this conversation um, offline if you wish. Great. Does anyone have any other questions? I just want to give people a chance. Um, ideas? Um, anything that they're doing with Google Slides that Susie didn't cover or anything? So Paige said thank you. Oh, thank you all. Um, is there any other questions as we're kind of wrapping this up? Um, so as this is wrapping up, um, do remember that um, be on the lookout for this recording. You will all get the recording. It will be hosted on um, YouTube. 
Um, so here is the link to where it, uh, all the webinars live from uh, this series. So uh, that is the overall guide. For, and then here's the link to the one specifically about online learning. So the next one coming up in the series about online learning is on March 13th at 11 a.m. The sign up is on that link I uh, sent you. And um, it's on Universal Design by Learning, The Basics, by Rob Owens, who is an ITC, one of the ITCs for the UNCG Bryan School. So he'll kind of just do an introduction to that. I love UDL. It's my favorite. So we should all be there. Um, and then the next one coming up for the Research and Application Series, which is on um, you know, mostly library resources, but really anything to do with research and application, is tomorrow at 12.30 they're doing one on Digitalia, eBooks and Streaming Film. Um, this is particularly useful for any um, LLC or foreign language. Uh, people are interested in that because of all the resources they have in um, different languages, Spanish being one of many that they have in there. The other one we have coming up in March, uh, if you can't make it tomorrow, is on OpenRefine, which is a free tool for messy data. Um, I love OpenRefine. It's great, and it's great to talk to Linda, our data librarian, about kind of getting started um, trying to wrangle your data. So be on the lookout for those. Um, there's also webinars um, on this page from the past ones we've done. Um, again, we're working on closed captioning all of them, but we're getting there. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. And when you are on the lookout for this recording um, and for other things, um, note that there will be a um, quick assessment uh, to let us know how you think this went. And uh, you're also welcome to email me directly if you feel more comfortable with that. But are there any questions as we're kind of wrapping up this webinar? Thank you, Susie. Okay, so um, I want to be cautious of people's time since we're past 1.30. So I will end this meeting. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, have a great week. It's only Tuesday. <laughs> and I'll see you all soon. Okay, bye.